speaking on a specific subject that many denominations and many that are inside or would include themselves in Christianity refute. And so I want to teach to you tonight, right out of the Bible, um, what the Bible says about tongues in particular and speaking in other tongues. I'm not talking about the tongue that James speaks of, of being an unruly poison, you know, speaking of the words that we use. I'm talking tonight, I'm going to teach from the platform in the Word of God what it says about speaking in other tongues. Now this is a subject that's uh, misunderstood and confused and, and, and is very confusing to many that are in the church. And I would go as far as to say tonight that this is the one thing that is rejected of all the things that the Holy Spirit brings to an individual and to the corporate church. And think about what I said for a moment, and let me just put this into your ear and into your mind as we're going through this tonight. The prophetic gifts, the gifts of healing, the gifts of miracles, all the things the Holy Spirit does to edify the church body, all of that is accepted. Even your denominations that don't necessarily believe in divine healing like we believe, they'll even ask for somebody to pray for their healing. They're not going to reject you. But when it comes to tongues, they will push you out the door in a heartbeat. They do not understand tongues. They don't know from the biblical platform what this is all about. And they just immediately dismiss it. So as I prepared this today and over the last couple of weeks was leading up to this, I've done a lot of teaching since I've been here uh, for eight years, we're going on eight years in July, on tongues in particular. And there's really not a whole lot of new stuff you can come up. There's not a whole bunch, but this thought came to my mind today, and, and I believe the Holy Spirit gave this to me, and I, I, I wrote this down today. Think about this. All the gifts and benefits of the Spirit that can be received are without effort on one's part except tongues. And I think that what I mean by this, and I'll show it to you in a moment, there's not a discipline that you can do to make yourself give a gift of the word of wisdom or operate in that gift. There's not a discipline. You can't go to a school to learn how to be a prophet. You can't go to a school to operate or learn how to operate in the gifts of miracles. You see what I'm saying? There's no way that you can learn that process or discipline yourself to become a part of that process. Now, I do know that there's disciplines we keep and it helps add to the effectiveness of those particular gifts. But when it comes to speaking in tongues, you have to maintain a very disciplined lifestyle with this. It's, it's a, there's a practice out of heart that's expected of us in this area. And in, I'm, I'm going to say to you tonight that it could be that the reason people reject this is because it does take discipline on the individual in order to see this practice carried out. You see, let me just say it like this about the modern church. The modern church is not a very serve-based church, meaning they don't, they're not too concerned about serving people like the Bible says as much as they're concerned with receiving. Well, if they come to church and get a good word, they're excited because they got a good word. It's not about giving something to somebody. It's not about utilizing that word. It's about getting something. Are you going to follow what I'm saying? By and large, that's the modern American church. They're a reception-based church. They want to get something when they show up to church. A lot of times it's based on entertainment. If the music's good and the preaching's good, there's a large crowd. And they all leave and they're the same, unfortunately. You see how that works in our society. So could it be that tongues is rejected for the simple fact that there's a, a discipline and an obedience, let's use that word, there's an obedience required in an individual's life to continue to walk in this, therefore it's rejected. I believe that's part of it. Anything that maintains an obedience in a child of God's life, you're going to have low numbers with. Prayer meeting. When you have a prayer meeting, you don't have the multitude at the prayer meeting. Hello, church. You can talk to me tonight on Wednesday nights. You know why? Because it takes obedience and discipline to be in prayer. Uh, study in the Bible. It takes obedience and discipline to maintain a study habit and a study work in your life when it comes to the word of the Lord and, and learning more about those things. You understand what I'm saying about this. So could it be that part of the rejection of the church today, of the teaching, which is a very biblical teaching I'm going to show you, when it comes to speaking in tongues and what all it entails and, and the parts that it works in and all the, all the bits and pieces that come with this, I believe that part of the reason the church rejects speaking in other tongues is not just because they don't understand it. It's not just because they were taught something. But I believe that it's because they have to discipline themselves to continue it. Mm -hmm. Anything that the child of God has to discipline themselves into is going to have low numbers. Yeah. Bottom line, I've observed this for eight years now in ministry. Even before that as a youth pastor, it always made me wonder and scratch my head how we could have a 
family fun night and man, people we ain't never seen show up. When we have a prayer meeting, everybody that you see all the time don't show up. Come on, help me, church. I think the storm has y'all's heads messed up tonight. Y'all can respond to me, all right? So when it comes to tongues, there's an individual responsibility, and this might be the factor that keeps people from desiring to move forward in this. So I'm going to look at tongues tonight in a biblical perspective and give you the truth of what the Bible says about tongues. There's three types of tongues that are spiritual manifestations of the Holy Spirit mentioned in the Bible, and I'll get to those individually in a moment. They're the initial evidence of when someone is filled with the Spirit. There's the prayer language, and then there's the gift of tongues. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But I want to start with this, with the biblical platform on tongues. Did you know that Jesus included spirit baptism and specifically the gift of tongues with the experience of being born again? In scripture, did you know that? Now, some might say, what do you mean? Does that mean I have to be, I have to be spirit-filled to be saved? No, that's not what I'm telling you. Although I, you may feel that I press the spirit baptism to a great degree, and the reason I do is because not only do I believe in it, not only have I encountered it, but Jesus pushed the experience as well. If you turn to Mark chapter 16, we see a platform here where we don't have to be filled to be saved, but once we're saved, there is a necessity that Jesus says, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that happens with this is revealed to us in Mark chapter 16. Some of your Bibles may not even have this passage in it. And I'm going to deal with that in just a moment, okay? And I'll explain why in just a moment. But look at verse 15 in Mark chapter 16. And he, this is Jesus now, said unto them, this is after he resurrected, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. We know that is the Great Commission, don't we? Yes? Okay, that's the Great Commission, right? Well, he didn't stop there. Look at what he says next. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, there's some denominations that take this in a literal sense and tell people, if you're not water baptized and baptized in the Holy Ghost, you'll go to hell. That's not what this is saying. In fact, they're really wrong, and it's unscriptural from what they're saying here. If water could save you, or anybody for that matter, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. So understand that. Do I believe people need to be baptized in water? Absolutely. It's a necessity. Not to their spiritual walk with God, and not to their salvation, but it is a public profession of their faith. And it's something where they're saying, I'm entering into this, and I need your help, and you have the right to come to me and say, your fruit is not being very Christian life if it's done the right way in the church family, okay? But what this is saying right here is it, when it says the word baptize, it's speaking of what we see happen in Romans chapter 6. Now, water baptism, but beginning there, Romans 6 and verses 3 through 5, it talks about baptism as a reflection of what happens to a person when they get saved, but it's not. it never mentions water. People put that word in there because it says baptize, so they immediately think water baptism. And it's not speaking of that. It's talking about what Paul used all throughout the New Testament in every letter that he wrote when it talks about being baptized into Christ or being in him. This is what we know in Christianity and in theological terms. When you start studying all of this in the Bible, this is what we know as regeneration. It's a big word, I know. But what that means is your soul has been cleansed by your faith in what Christ has done for you. You've been baptized into Christ. That's what it says in Romans chapter 6. It's not done by water. If we put you in that water, cleanses you, then the blood didn't do it all. Do you understand that tonight? Okay, so to be baptized into Christ is a work of the Holy Spirit. He's the only one that can do it. That's when he literally comes to live inside of you. You're being filled and cleaned and moved upon by him, immersed in the Spirit. He comes to live in you. So now... God, the Holy Spirit, is inside of you, and he's now trying to get your thoughts, and he's trying to become your desires, and he's trying the best he can without forcing you or me to begin to mold ourselves into the very image of the Son of God. It's all in the Bible. You can read that, okay? But this is why Jesus includes this here. He doesn't say that people have to be baptized in water to be saved, and it doesn't mean that you have to be spirit-filled to be saved. He's saying something. If you're going to be saved, to be born again, means that the Holy Spirit, you have to be baptized into Christ, as it says in Romans chapter 6, which is regeneration, all right? And so he goes on after that and says, he that doesn't do this will be damned, but they'll be in judgment. Verse 17, these signs will follow them that what? Believe. Believe. This is the very first reason people don't follow the idea of tongues, is because they don't believe. Okay? Listen to this. 
in my name they'll cast out devils. Now this can go either way. You gotta, there's got to be a balance to this, good and bad. You've got to find the center of the teaching, okay? Because there's some people that think everything's the devil. There's some people that don't think anything's the devil. There's got to be a balance, okay? When the wind blows and it breaks a branch off your house or on, oh, out of your tree on your house, it probably wasn't the devil. It was probably the wind blowing. I mean, the devil didn't stand up in your tree and break the branch off, okay? So keep a balance to what goes on. I mean, Satan's not after your house anyway. He wants your faith. He don't want your house. He can have anything he wants on this earth, all right? He's just after your faith. But here's the thing. They'll cast out devils. Look at the second one in verse 17. They'll speak with what? <clears throat> new tongues. This is not saying he's going to give you a new language. Speaking of, he's going to get rid of your foul mouth, although that is part of salvation. If you're saved and you really are born again, you're not going to say the same old words anymore. It may take some time to get you to arrive to that place because you've ingrained your mind and your heart with so many negative things for so long. It may take you a little bit. But I know in my case, when I got saved, the next day, those words were, it was like God just pulled them out of my heart. They were gone the next day. And that's not everybody's point of experience, but that's the most part I've heard from people. And it does say keep filthy communication out of your mouth if you're saved. But this is not what it's meaning right here. It's the same word in the Greek that's used for stammering lip in the Old Testament. They will speak with new tongues. And it goes on and says, they'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Now, as we know, this is the Great Commission, as Mark wrote it. There are those that say this is not included in many versions or manuscripts. And I went back, knowing this information myself, I went back today, and I wanted to just brush myself up on, on the teaching on that, where people say, well, this is not included in, in the newer manuscripts. So it's not going to be included in many of the translations of the English version Bible today. Like your NIV won't even have this in there in, in Mark chapter 16. And that's the most popular version. It's the, it's the version now that the Assemblies of God has went to. They don't even use the King James anymore for anything. And uh, that's why we don't do Bible quiz at this church. People might say, well, why don't we do Bible quiz here? They're using NIV and I'm not going to teach our kids a false representation of the Word of God. Amen. That's just where I stand. And it's not because it's King James. People get mad when they hear that. And they say, well, why do I have to understand King James? Because it's not just about reading the book. It's about learning the book. Let the Holy Spirit teach you what it means and what it says. I don't speak King James English. When I get up here and I teach you, I'm teaching our English where you can understand what this says. Well, why do you use that version of the Bible? It is the closest to the original manuscript that we have, people. I don't want a substitute. I want the closest thing to the original that we can get our hands on. And so the very first English version that we speak that was in our modern language was the King James Version of the Bible. Now understand this. If you go to Spain, they're not using King James. They're using a Spanish version of the Bible that was taken from the original manuscript. If it's done right. You understand this the way I'm telling you. Now listen to this tonight. If this is not in your Bible, then it was excluded. It may be in your Bible and have parentheses or, or uh, brackets around it that says this was not found in earlier manuscripts. And let me tell you this, and I'm going to say this, and this is online, and this is going to be on radio. That is a lie. It is a lie. Every manuscript that you go to except two, two, and I'm talking tens of thousands of manuscripts, have this passage included into it. The only two versions that do not came out of the Catholic Church. Imagine that. The Codex Vaticanus, and there's another one that starts with an S. I can't pronounce it right. It sounds funny if you don't pronounce it the right way, so I'm not going to take a shot at it. But I do have it written down, and I looked at it again today, and there's two versions that do not include this, and they were incomplete manuscripts. And yet the Catholic Church grabbed onto those texts and said, well, they're not here. We're not going to utilize them. And what it really does is, I mean, think about what spirit baptism is all about, church. It's about every believer being empowered, right? To do the works of Christ. And then what it says, you'll be my witnesses. So the Catholic Church's system is not set up that way. The Catholic Church's system is that everything goes through the priest, not through the person, right? And so if, if you follow that way of thinking, then they want to remove the power source of the people. So they're not effective witnesses. So the priest maintain the control of the structure. If you understand where I'm going with that. Don't have to get too far into it, but that's exactly why it's not there. So you might want to check the Bible versions. There's three authorized versions in English that go with our original manuscript. Every other version of the Bible was translated from another translation. 
And I've said this before, but I want you to hear these numbers tonight before I move on. Did you know that a copyrighted version of the Bible, there's only one uncopyrighted version of the Bible in, in America? That's the King James Version. Every other version that has that little C with a circle around it that you learned about in grade school has to be 80% different than any other version like it. What can you change from the King James to another 80% different without losing the truth of the Word of God? And yet people flock to these things because it's easier to understand. Well, if I was your enemy, I'd make it as easy as possible too. I, I mean, help me tonight. This is something that for hundreds of years in this nation, the church in this nation stood on this and they believed this as the word of God. And it's only in the last 50 years that all these men and women that carried the church for so long that somehow everything they've done is stupid to the new church. Well, we're more educated now. Really? Are we more educated? The Bible says that we'd ever be learning and never come into a knowledge of truth in the last days. And that's what's happening right now. That we're gathering knowledge and knowledge and knowledge and it's not benefiting anybody except their pockets. Probably shouldn't have said that part out loud. But anyways. <clears throat> Jesus, let me get back to this. Oh, well, let me tell you the three authorized texts. I probably got you itching now. You got the King James, the New King James, and the, there's two versions of this. You need to make sure it's the older one. The older New American Standard. I think it's pre-1971 or something like that. That is, honestly, the New American Standard Bible is the best word-for-word -word translation for our modern English for us to understand. I preferably use King James because it's closest to the original, and I've just always used it, and I like teaching from that, and I like reading from that. But anything outside of that is a translation from a manuscript that's incomplete, number one, or it's translated from another translation. That's weird to me. That's, that's a man taking a version of the Bible and saying, this is what sounds best to me. Let's make it easy. Y'all are real quiet tonight, church. So I just want you to understand that's, that's the basis of where the issue is. That's why your pastor has pulled away from some of the things that we do, and I'm not, I'm not upset about saying it. Uh, I know people are listening and watching, and uh, people all over the nation that, that uh, have an opinion about me, and I don't mind saying this out loud. I'm going to stick with truth, and I don't care what you think about me. I'm going to stick with truth, bottom line. That's how it is, and uh, truth will make you free. And uh, so, so let's stay the right way with the right thing. And, uh, and so, Jesus, I have to believe. Some say, well, is the Bible thing that big of a deal? Yes, it's that big of a deal. It's the only book we have to believe in. And so, I, I have to believe that God was there when it was all put together. And I have to trust that. Well, how do we know that man did Faith comes into this somewhere. We've got to have faith in all of this. And we've got to believe God. Don't you think that the God that wrote the book and used the penman to put it all down made sure that he chose what was going to be distributed all over the world? I mean, come on. And the one system that calls herself Christian, the Catholic system, at one time, go read your history books. Y'all remember what the Inquisition was about? Anybody that believed that Jesus died for your sins and you didn't have to do the things in the Catholic Church could be punished by death by the priest. Go read about it. The Inquisition. Anybody that owned a Bible could be punished by death by the Catholic Church. That's crazy to me. In fact, the man that printed them, he sold everything he had to print by his own printing press. William Tyndale, you know the story? Was burned at the stake by the very Bibles he printed to put in. His, his vision was to put a Bible in every plowboy's hand in England so they didn't have to be told by a man how to live for God. And he died for it. He died for it. And somehow we've taken that system and meshed it in to Christianity, and there's nothing Christian about the system. And I'm not afraid to say that. There's nothing Christian about that system. And so, anyways, let's get back on this, because I've taken a whole lot of time off this right here. Most of you guys understand this stuff. So why, you, why try to keep tongues out of the Bible? Why, to, why try to keep it out of the church? Well, number one, I think I put this on your deal. People are afraid of what they don't understand. People dismiss what they cannot control. Pastors get voted out of churches when people can't control them. Right. Tongues get kicked out of churches when people can't control it. When you can't control the Holy Spirit, who is God, he's not an emotion. They want him in the back room somewhere. I don't want all that stuff in my church. People start dancing and running, that weeds me out. Well, you just don't know being in his presence yet. You've never been overcome by what it is to be in the presence of God yet. Because I'm telling you, when I get in that, I get a little excited. And I can't help it sometimes. I don't know what's going to happen. 
And my Lord, if you have to climb one of these poles or run around the outside of the church and God's telling you to do it, then you do it. But if he's don't, don't do it. But if he's telling you, my Lord, you better go after it. You better take off running. And the Lord will help you in all of that endeavor. People are also prisoners to tradition. You know, most people in denominations that do not believe in spirit baptism cannot tell me why they don't believe in it. They've just been told they don't believe in it. Even pastors that I sit down with that have been in their movements longer than I've been alive cannot tell me why they don't believe in it. They've just been told that from somebody above them. I've got friends of mine that, that are Pentecostal preachers now that started out in other denominations. Some were Baptists, some were Methodists, some were other things that came out of that Orthodox Catholic system like Episcopalians and Presbyterians. Some of them, them guys got spirit-filled and their people kicked them out of the church because they were filled in the spirit. Did you know the Methodist Church used to be the source of all spirit teaching and preaching in our nation? If the Wesleys could see today what was made of what they believed in, they would have a fit. And they would probably go to the churches in this nation and probably do some things that people wouldn't think men of God would do. But sometimes it's necessary to call fire down from heaven and to get rid of the false prophets like Elijah did in his day. Sometimes people are concerned more with quantity than quality in their church. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, as long as the seats are filling up, the pews will teach whatever's comfortable. It even said the last days the church would do that. They would heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. They would be swayed by fables. Things that the church was told to do, they'd get away from just so more people would show up at the church. I'm here to tell you that the Lord wants the Holy Ghost in the church today. He wants the Spirit present, not just in the church, but in every one of our lives. And if that doesn't do it, as far as people, we do have an adversary who wants to remove the power from the church to do its mission. And if he can remove spirit baptism from the church and the teachings of individual empowerment and edification through tongues, as you're going to hear in a moment, then he's effectively taken away our source of strength and power to walk through everything that we're going to be facing in life when we get an onslaught of things. And so it would be just like taking your vehicle, taking the motor out tonight, and getting in the, the vehicle tomorrow morning without a motor, and beating the steering wheel, and saying, why in the world won't my car run? That ain't got no power. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is for me and you. We're the shell. We're the old vehicle. We're the transport of the gospel. But we don't have the proper motor in which to do it. We're a fallen nature. We have a fallen body. And so we need a power source. That's the Holy Spirit. So let me look at some very quick things, and I'll, I'll do my best to be quick. But here's some arguments against tongues. This isn't all of them. But I want to give you some arguments that I've encountered it personally. And in fact, I've told you this story before. You may have heard it. But I had a Baptist preacher very back like he's going to punch me one time over dinner about tongues and about some things with being spirit-filled. And I looked him in the face, and I said, Brother, listen to me. I'm going to pray for you the rest of your life that you get filled in the Spirit. Three years later, he called me and was crying and said, I have to apologize to you and ask you for forgiveness because I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. With the evidence of speaking in other tongues. He said, I'm so sorry that I embarrassed you and your eyes. I said, you ain't embarrassed me, buddy. You embarrassed yourself. You embarrassed the witness of Christ. But I pray for you every day, man. Had me come preach in his church that was a Baptist church, and it split the church. And I prayed long and hard about doing that. I'm not into splitting churches and causes confusion. But he had already had some, some uh, key members in that building that had been filled and wanted me to come minister on what it is and give the church an opportunity. And can I tell you that it did not split the church. Everybody in that building came forward. And I'd say the majority of them received spirit baptism that morning. And so when it's true and it's right, people will accept it. Most people don't know how to teach about this. They don't know. And I'm not saying I'm somebody special because I'm not. All glory goes to God. You hear me pray. Let the true teacher come. I don't have all of this stored up here somewhere. That's the Holy Spirit that helps me do all this. But when you can teach tongues and you can teach spirit baptism the right way, and you can lead them not to the encounter, but to make people understand why it's necessary, then people will start desiring to walk through it. So what's some arguments against tongues? Number one, you must speak in tongues to be saved. There's a Pentecostal denomination. You probably know it as the holiness movement, the oneness people that teach that if you do not speak in tongues, you can't go to heaven. This is unscriptural. If, if it meant that any one of the same thing with water baptism, they say the same thing, that if you're not baptized in the name of Jesus, you won't go to heaven. Well, I didn't know the name of Jesus was it. There's 700 different names for Jesus in the Bible. He's the Prince of Peace. He, I mean, there's so many different names that you can choose from. 
And they're, they're taking one phrase. When Peter used that in the book of Acts, you know what he was saying to Pharisees that were standing there? You have to denounce the Judaism. Christ was a threat to everything that you believe. So when he said, you must be baptized in the name of Jesus, read it in the book of Acts, Jews were asking him by the thousands, what do we have to do to be saved? You must be baptized. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, saying you are renouncing Judaism. That's why he was using that phrase. He was not saying that's the only way. In fact, if I'm going to follow any pattern in the Bible for baptism, I'm going to use Jesus's, because he was the greatest pattern of all. Matthew chapter 28, he said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. So that's why we do what we do, is because Jesus told us to. But you must speak in tongues to be saved. This is false. It, we're saved by what? Grace through faith, not by works. works. Well, tongues is not a work of the Holy Spirit, or not a work of, of man, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Wrong. Tongues is made to come about by the Holy Spirit, but we have a part to play. Every gift of the Spirit is manifested by a yielding vessel. A, a, a vessel that is faithful, believes, and they yield themselves to that gift or that operation. That's when the Holy Spirit moves. So don't tell me that, that this is just something that God's going to take over and do. Because, honey, if you stand there waiting for him to just do it on his own, nothing's going to happen. You're going to have to trust God somewhere with this. You might have faith somewhere. So to say that you must speak in other tongues to be saved is wrong because this is something man is participating in. And if man can do anything to be saved, then it's not going to work in the faith in Christ, right? So that's, that's where that comes down. You have to be baptized into Christ, like I said a moment ago in Romans, by the Holy Spirit being saved, but that's not the same as being spirit-filled. People have to learn the terminologies and learn what is what. One is regeneration of man, while the other is endowment for power, or of power from on high. Here's another one that you hear all the time. Well, tongues are going to cease, and we live in that time now. People use 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for this. A lot of our Baptist brethren use this. I'd say all of our Baptist brethren use this, and here's what they do. They take one verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, and it says, Charity never fell, but where there be prophecies... They will fail. And that word fail actually means stop or they will, they will cease. Whether there be tongues, they'll cease. Whether there's knowledge, it's going to vanish away. Now, when they see tongues there and it says it's going to cease, that makes them happy because they don't have to look at this. You got that from Mary, 1 Corinthians 13 and 8? They, they see this and they think, well, that means that it doesn't need to be in the modern church because it, it says it right here in the Bible. Well, let's read the whole passage in its entirety. And let's get proper context. You can't grab the main idea of what the Holy Spirit's saying by one verse of Scripture. You need to read above it. You need to read below it. You need to gather all the thought process and then make a determination. So let's go back. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10 gives the whole thought process. Love never fails, but where there be prophecies, they're going to fail. When there's tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it'll vanish away. For right now we know in part and we prophesy in part. Verse 10, listen to this. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away with. Everything here is talking of future tense. Now, I understand that was 2,000 years ago. But, but get this. That which has perfect has not come yet. What is it speaking of? The rapture. Jesus coming. None of us have, even though the Bible calls the Holy Spirit. you got to understand. you got to put it all together through all the letters Paul wrote. He calls the Holy Spirit at one point the earnest of heaven. Speaking of, we know what earnest money is, it's down payment. So he's saying that the Holy Spirit being in us is a down payment of what we're going to receive. It's already been paid for by Christ's blood and by our faith. But it's the final phase of redemption. We've got justification, sanctification, which the Holy Spirit's doing all of our life. Then we have glorification that happens at the rapture. Honey, that ain't happened yet. And so for them to say that this is going to stop, because it's already over with just because they don't want to believe in it is false. It's unscriptural. The rapture has not happened. So perfection has not come yet. And since perfection has not come yet, this stuff hasn't ceased yet. It's very simple. Right. They got to look at it on all of this, on the, the right terms, because script, the way scripture lays it out. Here's another one I've heard. Only one generation was able to do this. There's only a group of prophets and apostles that existed back then. Now there's a new growing teaching of this new age apostle thing uh, that's wrong too. 
Um, but there is, a, there is a truth to an apostolic ministry or an apostolic ministry, and I can show you what it is in the Bible, and I'm not going to do that for the sake of time tonight. But having one generation would mean that all of this stopped because God was only going to move in power in one generation of the early church fathers. Well, he's not a respecter of persons. And if he took this to start the church, you better believe it's going to take way more of what he got back then to maintain the church for thousands of years. Are you serious? You don't think we're going to need that power source to maintain what we have and to continue in what we have? So the move of the Holy Spirit, what they say, is, is, was just for one group of people. Well, if that's the truth, why are miracles still happening today? Right. If that's the truth, then why is there still some that do this and some that don't? It's not because God's changed his mind. It's because people have changed their heart in what they desire. They don't understand it, and they don't desire it, so they don't seek after it anymore. And so here's, let me show you what the Bible says, Acts 2 and 39. If you've been in our church very long, you've heard me preach this till I'm blue in the face right here. Acts 2 and 39. Peter's preaching at the, after he's filled the Spirit. Very first message. And now it's bold Peter under the power of the Holy Spirit instead of doubting Peter and, and, and denying Peter. <clears throat> but here he is. He says, for this promise is unto you and your children, all them that are far off, as many as the Lord our God may call. That's me and you, that last part. As many as the Lord our God may call. How many of you are saved tonight? You're that last part of that passage. And so for people to teach that one, one time frame in the, the will of God was exposed to the power of the Holy Spirit, of what we know as baptism in the Holy Spirit, is incorrect because right here, Scripture says that this, and it's speaking the promise that it's talking about. If you go back and look in Acts chapter 2, is the promise of the Father that Jesus called it in Acts chapter 1 and 4, which was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so he's calling, he's saying right here, this will happen to any generation. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 a moment ago, that does what? That believes. Right? Okay? Mark 16 and 17, here's the determining factor for all generations. Jesus said it, I just said it. They, will, they that believe will speak in new tongues. The problem isn't that God's not doing it. The problem is people don't believe it. Preacher, you telling me that if I stood up here and tried to receive spirit baptism I haven't received yet, that it's still a faith problem in me somewhere? Yeah. It's not a sin problem because he has the power to overcome sin. He's not. God knows that you need spirit baptism. Yeah. So somewhere there is a faith disconnect. Maybe it's just the simplicity of spirit baptism. Maybe somewhere in your mind you, you come to the church and, and, or you hear this and you think, well, I just really don't need it. Well, you're not going to receive it if that's what you believe. You have to believe in this. You have to believe it's necessary. And, and, and that's what it comes down to. A lot of people that won't receive, or it's, it's, a, it's a humility problem a lot of times. I don't need it. That's humility. Really? You don't need the Holy Spirit to empower you. You're telling God that, well, I'm smarter than you, and I'm stronger than you, and I can do it on my own. Well, remind me next time when you crawled upon the cross and died for man. Because last time that we need this, Jesus said, he even told the ones that were with him for three and a half years, don't you leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. They had tasted that power before. They were sent out 70, two by two, and they had seen miracles and things that went on, and it wasn't them doing it, and they even acknowledged that. And because he had a little taste of it, they went to the upper room and they waited. Not all of them, 120 of them, the rest of them didn't think it was necessary. Over 500, the book of Corinthians says, heard Jesus at the Mount of Olives before he ascended, and only 120 went to the upper room. See, all these denominations didn't start in America. They started back then, when Jesus ascended, when men decided it's not necessary to walk in any movement of power. I can figure this out. And all men can. Men can get gatherings at a church. Men can fill seats at a church. But it don't mean anything spiritual is happening. And it don't mean God's there. You follow me, church? So, they that believe is the determining factor of faith, which is always the determining factor in everything that we do in Christianity, faith. Tongues are just languages that you use to talk to somebody. That's, that's the, you know, I've heard this one, this is the Baptist way of explaining somebody that really can't argue with you about tongues not being real, so they say, well, it's just another language. No, it's not just another language. Yes, it is another language. That's what the Bible teaches. I'll show you. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues. As who gave the utterance? The Spirit gave the utterance. It says that there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. 
That's, that's pretty neat when it says that there. Every nation that was on the earth at that time was present in Jerusalem. Now when this noise was brought, the multitude came together, they were confounded and confused because every man that they heard was speaking in their own language. Now remember, these were unlearned men. These were not men that were taught by rabbis. These were the men that they dismissed and said, they'll never be anything, so we can't teach them like we can some of these other Jewish boys. We're going to let them be fishermen and carpenters and tax collectors. These aren't people that we're going to invest in. And so here's these men now. They're all, it says they were confounded because every man was speaking in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all of these Galileans? Which Galilee was actually a, it was kind of a shot in the, uh, to the Jew. Man, if you were from Galilee, you weren't from good stock. That's, what the, that's why they're even saying this. It was like saying, aren't them the dummies in our society? And they're speaking in our language. They're uneducated. They don't even know. They've never had a day of school in their life. They went to the Rialo like I did. Uh, yeah, that's probably why I'm bad too that I said that. Hallelujah. Anyways, it says, but how do we hear every man in his own tongue where we were born? So we see here that tongues are a language. But here's the catch to it. It's a language spoken by the Holy Spirit, past, present, or future, but it's unknown to the speaker. The speaker has no idea what's being said. In 1 Corinthians 14, it even tells us this, that when a man's speaking in a dummy, he's speaking mysteries, and he's speaking to God. He has no idea what's being said. So, so to say, goes back to being a work of man again. To say that I can learn another language, and that's the Holy Ghost, is saying that I can do this without the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, because I can do it on my own ability. It's not about your understanding. But it's about faith believing in what the Lord wants to do through your life, embracing that and letting the encounter take place. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what happened that day was not a miracle because of people learning languages. It was a miracle because God was revealing the gospel to all nations through men that didn't even know the language, but the ones standing by heard it. Does that mean that there has to be somebody that knows that language in the room? No, because it's not a translation. We, we went through this in the gifts of the Spirit. It's not a translation of a language that's heard. It's an interpretation of the tongues that we're given. So it's not a word-for-word -word translation. It's an interpretation that God gives somebody to give understanding in that known language to those people. So keep the criteria of the tongues again. Somebody has to be the one speaking, and the Spirit has to give the utterance. And there's still many out there that refute what goes on and, and how it's to be done and how, according to the Bible. And most of these popular doubts aren't even established by Scripture. They just, it's what they think. So there's many out there. I'm going to look at these three kinds of tongues. Still got time with me real quick? Yeah. I'll go with them very quickly. <clears throat> Initial evidence being the first one. This is one of our 16 fundamental truths in the Assemblies of God. And I've said this over and over, and I mean this, and I stand on this. If this is ever removed as one of our 16 tenets of faith, meaning that we do not believe that the initial evidence is be, of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is speaking in other tongues. If we ever change that doctrine, because that's what the Bible teaches, we're leaving the Assemblies. I'm just going to let everybody know that ahead of time. And I'm not afraid to say that. And listen, you might think this is crazy. I think it's crazy that I hear people watching us all over. But I know there's leadership in our movement that watches and listens to what I say. And I'm telling you, the moment we move from our fundamentals, we will either change the leadership structure, which won't probably happen, or we'll get out of this thing. And we'll follow what the Bible teaches us to follow. Amen. So that's, that's just where we see but all scriptural evidence is that anybody that receives baptism in the Holy Spirit will speak in other tongues. Let me show it to you. I want to establish it, like I said, in scripture. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The day of Pentecost is fully come, and they were all in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled the house where they were sitting and appeared unto them, clothed in tongues of fire, and it set upon each of them. They were all, I like that, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak in other tongues and the, as the Spirit gave them the utterance. This is the first instance. This is like the foundation of spirit baptism and what is to take place, what it's going to look like. And we see on the foundational moment that the Spirit came to the church in the endowment of power time of what we know right now that we're presently in. When the Spirit rested on them, they would speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Now notice this. It doesn't say that people did what they thought or what they felt. It doesn't say that some danced, some sang, and some jumped and shouted. Now listen to me. I don't believe for one second that what we have going on in our church was not what was going on in that 120 room that day. That upper room had people that were running and shouting. I could guarantee you, because it's the same Holy Ghost. That's then, there was now. Okay? He hasn't changed. So I have to believe there was some shouts going on.
But in the midst of all of that that happened, that initial moment that everything took place, tongues began to come out of their mouths as they yielded themselves, and the Spirit began to give the utterance. There's people out there today in our movement and in other Pentecostal denominations they teach that a person can get filled and the initial evidence is whatever they think it can needs to be. It's not what Scripture says. Scripture says they all speak in tongues. They use that word all, not saying, it's not saying that everybody needs to speak. It's showing that there was one common thing that happened to all of them at the moment they received the Spirit in the power. And what was that thing? They spoke in other tongues. It didn't document dancing. I bet it went on. David did it in the Old Testament. He only had a portion of this. So I'm telling you, I can guarantee you somebody was cutting loose in that upper room. It doesn't document shouting. I guarantee you somebody was shouting. If you've ever felt the Holy Spirit and the power of God in a, in a worship service, and that's what was going on for those days. They were tarrying and praying and worshiping for days up there until the power fell on them. And you better believe there was some shouting going on. But it didn't document that. It said that every one of them, all of them, spoke in other tongues. And so we get our platform, our foundation from that. But there's more evidence to it than just that. Scripture even gives you a little thing. It says that, that a truth is established on two or three witnesses. Well, the Bible gives you four different times. In the book of Acts alone, where people spoke in tongues when they initially received spirit baptism. Let me show you these. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 19. There was a man named Simon. And the Bible called him a sorcerer. He was a warlock. He probably read Harry Potter. And uh, it says in verses 14 through 19 that this man wants to be saved. And he starts following the disciples around. And, and there's a revival going on in Samaria. And, uh, and Philip was down there preaching. And you know the story after this. Philip's going to be whisked away by the Spirit into the wilderness. And an Ethiopian eunuch comes along. And he's reading the book of Isaiah. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he's, I don't understand what I'm reading. How can I know it? He's, uh, he's empowered by the Spirit. He jumps upon the chariot. He tells him about Jesus. He gets saved. They baptize him in a mud puddle. It doesn't say mud puddle, but it, that's what happened. And, uh, well, if I put some people in muddy water today in this nation, they, they'd blow me out of here. I'm just being ugly tonight, ain't I? Yeah, easy killer. I got you. Listen here, look at some of these other. But here's, here's what happens. This warlock wants to be saved. He sees it. He, and it does say he believed on Christ. He follows the disciples around in Samaria now when the revival's happening. He sees what's happening. And he says this. He says, I want the power they have. Because he saw something with his own eye taking place. Now watch, verse 14 through 19. The apostles, which were in Jerusalem, heard Samaria receive the word of God. They sent Peter and John, who, when they had came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they that were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. That's part of where we get our teaching to laying on a man. All right? And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given, and don't take that out of context, they were not giving it to them, because man doesn't baptize anybody. Jesus is the baptizer. They were simply being faith contact points with these individuals. And when Simon saw that this was happening, he offered them money. And he said, give me this power also, so whoever I lay my hands on can receive the Holy Ghost. You've got to remember tonight that all the signs that come with spirit baptism, whether it be tongues or gifts or even people being slain in the spirit, isn't a man and God giving anybody power to do anything. It's the Holy Spirit doing everything and the faith of the person that's standing in front of that individual that's being honored by God at that moment. So we see there's a distinct mark of receiving the spirit in Samaria. Now, let me ask you this, because it doesn't necessarily say speaking in tongues right here, but in a moment when I read these other passages, it's pretty simple and pretty clear that something went on that miraculously and supernaturally got the attention of a warlock. Think about that. If people were just dancing, you think that would have got his attention? Because a man can manifest dancing. I've seen some pretty terrible representations of it. Men can represent running. Men can manifest jumping and shouting, but men cannot manifest speaking in other tongues. It doesn't happen. And so when he saw this happening, and he saw this taking place, he desired not to have the experience himself, but he wanted to help others have the experience. That's pretty sad. He wanted, really didn't even want that. He wanted power is what he wanted. And he didn't really understand what it was all about. So we see there was a mark 
one walk that marked this. Acts chapter 10 records it in verses 44 through 47. It says Peter was preaching in an Italian's house. They didn't even believe up to this point. The Jews didn't believe that anybody could get saved that wasn't a Jew. Even with Jesus, they did not think that people could get saved. This was the moment where Peter realized Gentiles can be saved. And thank the Lord for it, because as long as I know I'm not a Jew, so thank God the Gentiles can be saved. All right, I'm a mix of all kinds of stuff out there. And then and, and, and Paul gets called to the Gentiles, and he takes off and he plants churches, and we exist today because of what the Apostle Paul did to the Gentile churches. All right? But Acts chapter 10, he's preaching at the Italian's house as the Lord told him to go in a vision. And it says, while Peter was speaking those words, he's preaching to them about Jesus. Being anointed, it says in, in that 38th verse, how he went around doing good, anointing of the Holy Ghost, healing all of them that were oppressed of the devil. It says that when they heard his word, they of the circumcision which believed were astonished because the, as many as came to Peter, because the Gentiles had the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out on them. How did they know that? Were they running and shouting and dancing? Look at verse 46. For they heard all of them speaking with tongues. We're not making this up. It's right here in the Bible. They were all speaking with tongues and magnifying God. And then answered Peter, can any man from them order that they can now be baptized? So we see something else here. Some people teach you have to be saved, baptized in water, then you can see your Holy Spirit. Listen, the only thing that has to come in order is salvation. You can be filled without being baptized. I was. I was filled in my bedroom floor. Didn't even know what was going on. Nobody ever taught me about tongues. And thank the Lord, because I probably would have had a tradition instilled in me somewhere. So I'm glad I didn't know about it. It happened in my bedroom all alone, and it was messing me up in the head. So I called my pastor. I was like, what's going on? And he said, this is happening to you alone. I'm like, yeah, and it's, it's freaking me out. <laughs> you know? He said, let me come talk to you and tell you what's happening. And, uh, and it didn't even happen again after that run away. There was a moment in my life where something built up where I'm going to teach you in just a moment one of these other forms of, of tongues and why it's so valuable. But then after that moment, it remained in my life. But we see here that people received the Spirit, and immediately upon receiving the Spirit, what happened? They spoke in tongues. One more. Acts chapter 19, verse 6. You read the word verses 1 through 6. I think I put that on your, on your sheet. Paul walks up to some believers on the way to Ephesus. This would become the people that make the church that we have the book of Ephesians for. These people would go start that church. It records that there was 12 of them, and it says that he walked upon them, and Paul's first, his, his first question to people wasn't, do you pay your tithes, or what church do you go to, or who's your favorite preacher, or you know, who you follow on TV, or what book did you read lately? That's the newest thing that people ask everybody, well, it, especially in the ministry. They ask, what book did you read? And I tell them, I read the Bible. And just kind of look at me like, oh, well, you're so cynical. Well, last night, there's so much in there, I don't need to read any other books. I've got enough to learn but for a whole lifetime. And then, so Paul's first question to people when he walked up to him and met him is he asked him this. He says, when he knew that they were followers of Christ, he asked him, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And it says they didn't even know what the Holy Ghost was. It sounds like today. People don't even know what we're really talking about. Well, they've heard of it. They've heard these torture stories from the old Pentecostal church. And thank God we had some people that believed in Pentecost. Amen. But for some reason they went and somebody's drunk daddy went to a service, didn't like what he saw, and he left there that night, didn't get saved, didn't get filled. And so he thinks because he's got the devil in him, the tongues ain't right. And those stories get passed down. Ain't no chandeliers in here to hang on. Ain't nobody rolling around on the floor. But if the Lord tells you to do it, then you need to do it. But here's what I'm saying to you tonight. We need to get back to this mentality. You know why Paul asked if they had been filled? Because he believed that the power source came from heaven. It didn't come from man. And he knew that if they were going to maintain a church, and if they were going to maintain their Christianity on a daily basis as believers, they needed a source of power that they didn't have to do it. And so they had to seek after spirit baptism. Verse 6, it says, when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spoke with what? Tongues. Tongues. This is not some far-fetched teaching. It's right here in the Bible. Unfortunately, it's not in a lot of people's Bibles because they're not using Bibles from the correct manuscripts. It's funny that when you use another form, tongues are removed. So it's fasting. It could be people don't believe in fasting because it's not in the Bible they read. Read it. There's so much omission. 
in, in a lot of these translations, guys. You've got to really get back to the basics of this. We see here that Paul lays his hands on this group of people and immediately receiving the Spirit, they pray in other tongues. So we see every time somebody receives the baptism in the Holy Spirit for the first time, every time that that happened in Scripture, it's documented that they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gives the others. Right? I mean, it's, this isn't an assumption. It's established. Four times in Scripture right here, it's, it's established that this one pattern took place every time over and over. So let's go to the prayer language. What is the prayer language? This is one of the most powerful things a believer can ever continue in once you're saved and you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is a continued work of the Holy Spirit after we receive the Spirit of baptism. What it is, it says the, the, the Holy Spirit begins to move through you in what we call a prayer language, where he will speak in other tongues during your prayer time, even during worship time here in the church. And I, I shared this as we were looking at the gifts of the Spirit, like the gifts of tongues. And, and here's what people need to understand about the gifts of tongues and the prayer language. It's okay to pray and worship in tongues in a worship service. But that doesn't mean that that's the gift of, the, of, the gift of tongues. No, right? and, and, and it doesn't mean that if somebody speaks in tongues, some people get 1 Corinthians 14 and they think it's this checklist that you have to go down. It's a checklist for a church that's out of order. There's a difference. You know, there are a lot of charismatic churches. We don't have that going on here where everybody in there thinks they got a word from God. And everybody in there thinks they have a ministry, a full-time ministry. And everybody in there thinks they're up there with Christ somewhere because they follow this teaching that they're all gods, little gods. It's what they're being taught. And so they all think they're, they're, they're equal to him. And, uh, and so this is put in place for churches like that. Where everybody wants to prophesy. Everybody wants to give a word. Everybody wants to give a message in tongues. And when everybody's wanting to do it, there's no humility and love involved. It's all about them being seen doing it. That's really what it comes down to. And so we have this structure put in place, not because we need to limit the operation of the Spirit. There's no way God would want to limit His presence in a church service. That's ludicrous to even think about. What He's telling us is when it's out of order, put it in order. So the prayer language can most definitely be present in the room. What believers have to be able to trust and know the difference between is when are you being emotionally overwhelmed with the prayer language, maybe because you've had a hard day or a hard week, and maybe when you got into the presence of God in a corporate service, which is not a bad thing. He does things different in a corporate service than he does in your secret place. And so at that moment, you might get overwhelmed. That's good. That's okay. It's biblical for that to happen. And if that happens, it doesn't mean it's the gift of tongues. So the believer, that individual, needs to discern from the Spirit which is which. And that's not bringing confusion. You'll know. I promise you. You will know when it's the gift of tongues when it's the prayer language. And so I've heard people that come visit our church before and they're like, well, I just don't like being there when all the people are speaking in tongues because the Bible says that it has to be interpreted. No, it doesn't interpret the prayer language. It interprets the gift of tongues. And so you need to get your stuff right. You need to follow Scripture and what it says. Okay, so prayer language then is shown to us in scripture like this. Romans 8 and 26. There's a, a very key passage about this. It says, likewise, the spirit helps in our infirmities. Aren't you glad that the comforter that Jesus said would come is going to help us in our difficulties and our hard times? Thank the Lord. How, what do you mean he's going to help us? We don't know what we should pray for. There's been so many times I go into God and I, I know I need to pray, but when I go in there, I don't know what to say. I know what I'm feeling. Some of it's anger. Some of it's even towards him when he ain't do it. You know what I'm saying? I'm just looking at heaven thinking, really? You know, and I don't know what to say. Like it says right here. And it says the spirit himself. Greek, it says himself. It doesn't say itself. It gives it an actual pronoun here. Himself. The spirit himself makes intercession for us with what? Dancing? Groaning. That cannot be uttered. That whole phrase right there is the exact same word in the Hebrew for stammering lips and an unknown tongue. Groanings, which cannot be understood. So you mean to tell me, that's why I call it a prayer language, you mean to tell me that when I get into prayer sometimes that the Holy Spirit is going to take over and going to begin to speak in languages in my prayer time? Yes. Why is that so valuable? Let me show you 1 Corinthians 14, 18 through 19. Paul said, I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words of understanding that my voice might teach others than 10,000 of an unknown tongue. So he's showing that there's something that's participated in absent or in his private time. Not in the church, but in a private time. 
He's speaking in tongues. This is, this is showing us a pattern here. And then it shows that there's something participated on or in away from church. Why is it so vital to me and you, Isaiah 28, 11, and 12? You've heard me preach this. Paul even quotes this in 1 Corinthians 14. You look it up in 1 Corinthians 14. He quotes this passage. And he says that it was a prophecy of what would happen in the church. It says, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. To whom he said, this will be the rest that will cause the weary to rest. And this will be the refreshing. But they would not listen. If that doesn't sound like the modern church, I don't know what does. A tired, weary, run-down church that's thirsty because they're facing the onslaught of Satan right in their own society. That's America. They're hungry, and they're thirsty, and they're tired. And God promised, I will give you the rest of the refreshing to carry you through that. But unfortunately, it says in that last part, they would not listen. That's our churches. They won't listen to what God's offered. Well, it just seems stupid. See, that's faith again. You don't believe. You have to believe it. It says here that speaking in a prayer language, this isn't talking about in church. Oh, it'll give it to you. I mean, this, this can fall into the gift of tongues and the interpretations of tongues. This can work for that because it gives rest and it edifies the church body. But what this is speaking about is the spirit of an individual being lifted up and being edified, being built up in faith as the Holy Spirit speaks through them. Are you sure this is what this really is? First Corinthians 14 and 4. Listen, he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. I'm not just making this up, trying to establish the teaching. I'm teaching you what the Bible says. When you speak in a prayer language, it builds your spirit. It's something powerful. I can't understand this on my own, in my own carnal knowledge of being a man. But here's what I do know. In the most difficult moments that I've ever faced in my life and in ministry, when I got into the secret place, I didn't know what to say. But I would just begin to praise the Lord and worship Him. Because I didn't know what else to say about what I was facing. You know how hard it is to believe God for $20,000 a month? Right now, at this church? Weekly? Where we don't know if we can even write the checks every week? You know how hard that is to have to stand in the gap and plead with that? I don't know what to say. I've even expressed it to God at times. and be like, God, you told me to do this. <laughs> this is your will, not mine. Where's the provision? And in those moments where I want to express my frustration in my own language, tongues would start flowing. And listen, I can't explain it to you, but how I felt about that situation, although the situation did not change, how I felt about that situation and how I faced it was totally different when I came out of that prayer closet. David, <laughs> coming out of that prayer closet. Rest, which is to help you through what you endure. Refreshing, to get you ready for what's to come. Preacher, that don't sound like a very good Christian walk. Well, if you're not being Opposed by your adversary, you're no threat. And I don't want to be one of those that sit aside. I want to be one of them that hell knows my name. Not because I'm going there, but because I've stood outside its gates. I said, you will not prevail. Not while I'm here. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 15 says this. Paul said, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. How awesome is that? Instead of my mouth and my brain, my mind and my subconscious praying, it's my spirit that's doing the praying now. I'm sure my spirit would have a whole lot of good things to say to God instead of me. It says, in my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? He said, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with understanding. Listen to this. Then I said, it's okay to do a worship service, right? He said, I will sing in the spirit. It's okay in a worship service to sing or pray in a prayer language. People are trying to eliminate this today in the assemblies and in Pentecostal churches. Oh, well, we just don't want it there because it makes people that are visiting uncomfortable. It's supposed to make them uncomfortable. That's what it says. It's a sign of them that they don't believe. They don't believe in none of this stuff. They're supposed to be uncomfortable. Man, if you walk in and you're comfortable with tongues, something might be wrong with you. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. When you first, man, if you're in the presence of God and you're not uncomfortable, something's wrong. You should never be irreverent in the, pre the presence of God. Man, if you, would, if you could ever think about standing before the ark of God in the Old Testament, you would have trembled in fear. Yep. I promise you, you would have. And in the 
presence. Today, we don't even have to have that fear. But there's something reverent that happens in us when we get into his presence. So there's a personal benefit to speaking in tongues, whether it be speaking, singing, moaning, groaning, all these forms of the prayer language help us walk out in this life with fresh power from God on an everyday basis. So speaking in tongues is full, guys. Third one, last one. Say amen to that. Amen. The gift of tongues. It's the last one. I won't go very far on this one because I've already taught on it a couple weeks ago when we looked at the gifts of the Spirit. But this is the gift that we see in operation in church service where somebody's prayer language gets a little louder than everybody else's. And, uh, and that's when the gift is manifest. And, and there's not a proper way of this happening. Some people, again, want to give a checklist and say, well, there's only two or three that need to do this. It's not even what Scripture says if you see it right. It says that when everybody comes together and says they have a word, in a, a prophesying word in the known language, then there needs to be no more than two or three to make sure that people don't get confused. He says but when there's messages in tongues, let the people hear and let them listen and let there be an interpreter. But here's what it says about what has to happen with the gift of tongues. 1 Corinthians 14 and 13 says, Wherefore, let him that speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he will interpret. So if you feel the gift of diverse tongues moving on you and you feel that you need to give a message in tongues, the very first biblical thing you're required to do is begin to pray that God gives you the interpretation. That's what it says right here. That also means that any spirit-filled believer in the building needs to be praying for the interpretation as well. Because anybody that's spirit-filled is a, that they're able, they're a candidate for the Holy Spirit to move through and to give that interpretation to. 1 Corinthians 14, 27 and 28 says, If any man speaks in an unknown tongue, but if he got two, most three, that of course, that one would interpret. That if there be a no interpreter, let them keep silent in church, or he himself, or keep it to himself and to God. So here's what we have to know about the gift of tongues. If you know that there's people that operate in the interpretation of, get, or of, of tongues that are in that service and they're not there that day and you don't feel the interpretation, then you need to hold it in. That's what Scripture's saying. And, and, if, and if there's that awkward silence in church, and there is, sometimes there's moments where people are in their flesh. Preacher, you're not supposed to talk about I'm just being honest with you. That's all we are is flesh. So when you get 200 plus people in a room, somebody in that room is going to be in their flesh. I guarantee it. And sometimes, I mean, listen, I've said this before. But when your, your little children were learning how to walk, they didn't do it without falling down and getting bumps and bruises. When they learned how to talk, they, they probably had to get told no on how to say certain things. And they probably said words that you didn't even say, but they heard from somebody else. And you taught them very quickly, don't do that. Right? Maybe y'all's kids aren't as bad as mine. I don't know. But here's, they've been around their mama too long. But anyways, here's what I know. Walking in the Spirit doesn't happen overnight. That's right. And when you get saved and you receive Spirit baptism, it's a lifelong process. Your prayer language will even change if you continue in it. And it'll sound more pronounced and more defined. It won't even sound like it did in the beginning. It'll sound like stammering and sputtering in the beginning when you get filled. But if you go into a prayer closet and you learn to let this happen, it becomes like a, it sounds like a language that starts developing. You don't even know what you're saying, but you're speaking mysteries to God, it says, and you're being edified by it, so there's value to it. But here's what we know. As you continue on in this, and you continue to do it, it's going to begin to grow. And so you've got to allow this to happen in our, in our church services, in your private time. You've got to allow this to continue to grow. And you have to mature in the gifts of the Spirit just like you mature in your physical life. Some of us will be elders in the things of the Spirit. And that has no age on it. Somebody that's 25 years old can be an elder in the things of the Holy Spirit because of the way they seek after the Lord and the things that he deposits into them. The Apostle Paul, in a little less than four years, was dropped the entirety of the new covenant into his heart. Friends, I'm telling you, God can do some incredible things, but you've got to have him in his presence. One thing is for sure in Scripture, tongues are a part of the move of the Spirit. And they're to be incorporated into the church body and into the individual life of any believer, the key word being, that they believe that this is something that will happen. Scripture even says it like this. I'm closing. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 19. It says, quench not the Spirit. I shared this couple of Wednesdays ago, but I feel like I need to say it again. 
Quenching the spirit is not when the preacher stops what's happening during the music and all the musicians think that he should continue on. It's funny how musicians somehow think they have it figured out more than the pastor who's told by God to pastor the church. But it happens. I'm not saying it happens here. I've heard musicians come off the platform sometimes here, a lot of times at other churches. I've heard them when they didn't know I was standing there. said, man, the pastor just missed the move of God today. Really, do you think God's going to let the man of God miss the move of God? Really? Maybe you just ain't spent time in your prayer closet. And you ain't got what you needed every day. So you got up here and you got it poured on you instead of just saturating you through the week. Amen. All right. But what this passage means is don't stop the spirit from moving in the church. That's not a music service. That means do not restrict the move of God, all the gifts, from operating the right way in the church. Preacher, why do so many places across the country do it? I can't tell you exactly why. I just know they don't believe. Why ever they don't believe is on them, but they don't believe. The scripture is very clear that it should be happening. 1 Corinthians 14, 39 says this, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, I mean, desire to be used in a known language where everybody can edify from that. Okay? And leave your tongues to your private mouth if you can. But listen to what it says. But do not forbid to speak in tongues. I got churches right now. Just off the top of my head, I can name five of them in Texas, Canada that believe in the full gospel. They believe in the movement. It's not just AG churches. All different types, non denominations. But I can think of five right off the top of my head who have mass numbers coming to their churches. But the mass crowd started coming when they were forbid speaking in tongues in their church service. Makes people comfortable. Makes people powerless. That's what it does. Makes people powerless. It removes a vital part of that church service and their personal life that God desires for them. And for those that think that it shouldn't be done, the Bible addresses this too. 1 Corinthians 14, 37 to 38. I'm done right here. If any man thinks himself to be a prophet, listen to this, or even considers himself spiritual, I'm spiritual. I know what I'm talking about. Let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are, look at that word, commandments of the Lord. He's talking about tongues, the gift and the prayer language. This whole chapter is dedicated to that. And look at the last part, how Paul puts it. I would love to meet had Paul in person and have him preach at our church. <laughs> look at the next part he puts in there. If any man's going to be ignorant, just let him be ignorant. <laughs> so I say, well, why did the Holy Spirit put that in there? You know why God's telling us right there? People that don't want to believe and they want to be dumb, let them be dumb. Let them have their own church. Let them do their thing. Paul would even tell his understudy Timothy at one point, don't argue and have debates about Scripture. Just let it be. Believe what you believe. Sometimes I think if we feel like we have to prove something, we're having to stand in for God. God can take care of himself. Yeah. And this word is settled. It ain't changing. So God can convince who wants to be convinced. And he can convince those that believe. You don't have to convince them. The gospel will do it itself, right? Yeah. But tongues is powerful. Very powerful. And we need to participate. And all three parts of this, we need to make sure that we continue in this yeah. and allow the Spirit. As long as I pastor in church, we're going to have the Spirit move. Yeah. Yeah. Not because I do it, but because we welcome Him. He won't do it where He's not welcome. That's right. When we welcome Him in, we're going to see it. We're going to see some things. Listen, as our church continues to grow and sinners come in here that have addictions, we're going to see some weird stuff happen. Yeah. We're going to see some manifestations of demons at times. But those that are spiritual will know what to do. There may be moments that I even have to stop in the pulpit and say, get so-and-so in the back and deal with it. That's what happens when the move of God starts taking place. And church, I don't know about you, but there's something happening. Yeah. And when people are getting saved like it is right now, I'm telling you, there's something coming. Yeah. We've already had to set over our church for the last two or three years. Something's on its way. And those who are spiritual Lord. are going to participate in it. Lord. Those that aren't are going to think it's just something stupid. I'll just find a church. We'll go find a church and die. Paul said, those who want to be ignorant, let them be ignorant. <laughs> so it's not me being ugly. Paul, Paul made me do it. Hallelujah. <laughs> you see it right there.
can't imagine what Paul would have said in person if he'd have been in churches today in America. Can you imagine what he would say if he walked in some of the churches in our nation? He'd probably get mad because we had air conditioning. I'm telling you, Paul was concerned about people getting saved and spreading it everywhere. He wasn't concerned about comfort. He was concerned about Christianity. We gotta, we gotta look into that. Anyway, bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Let me pray with you. We'll let you out of here. Father, we love you. We thank you for all you do. Thank you for the teaching. Thank you for the word of God. And Lord, I know tonight that some of the words I said, um, not in this building to our people, but some that heard us online, some that are going to hear on the radio, are going to hate and dislike what they hear. But Lord, it's not that I'm an offense. The gospel's an offense. We've gotten away from the word of God, but we have to get the church back to the truth. And so, Lord, use me as often as you will to present truth because we know truth will make us free. So be with us, Lord, in all that we do. Let this church fulfill what it is that you want us to fulfill. Go with us in safety tonight. Touch all of our church family that's sick or hurt or down and be with them. Heal, lift them up, and move in their lives. And we'll give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. We love you. And we will see you on Saturday, then at the breakfast, and then Sunday at church, if you're not.